Is that thing on? Yeah. <laughs> uh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Princess Diana, once the most famous face in the world. But there was always a private Diana known only to a few. If you come in here, you sit down and be quiet. You've got to be very quiet. Very quiet. Don't touch it, William, because it's all focused on me. And this Diana had a story to tell. I was brought up in the sense that, you know, when you got engaged with someone, you love them. In 1992, she recorded a series of videotapes with her speech coach. Whereupon he leapt upon me, started mm. kissing me and everything. I thought, well, yeah, you know, you know, this is not what people do. And it was all over me. This was a different Diana, an unseen Diana, talking candidly. We met 13 times when we got married. with a story that was rocking the foundations of the British monarchy. I went to the top lady and I was sobbing and I said, what do I do? I'm coming to you, what do I do? And she said, I don't know what you should do. John the papers. And that was it. That was help. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. There is no other footage that reveals her spirit so intimately. A princess searching for the voice that the establishment would come to fear. You get into telling the story? No, I'm not. You're a storyteller. If you feel strong about a point, make it very strongly. You see how far you can go. This is BBC Radio in London. A French government minister has said within the past few minutes that Diana, Princess of Wales, has died. He said she was killed in a car crash in central Paris. I'll repeat that. Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car crash in the centre of Paris. This is a story from an ancient land about a prince and his princess. But this is not an ancient tale about chivalry. This is a modern story. Here was a fairy story that everybody wanted to work. I knew that something profound was coming my way and I was just um, treading water, waiting for it. I didn't know what it was, I didn't know where it was, I didn't know if it was coming next year or, or next month, but I knew I was different from my friends in where I was going. It was the spring of 1981. The United Kingdom was in disarray. Jobs were scarce. Rioters took to the streets. This was what Britain's story had come to. Perhaps, as the princess said, most of us were ready for a fairy tale. Nineteen forty eight, a royal christening. A future queen and a boy born to be king. Charles Philip Arthur George. Nineteen fifty three, a coronation. In the four corners of the earth, her subjects and claim Elizabeth is queen. The stage was set. There was a queen, Elizabeth. There was a prince, Charles. Only the princess was missing. 
Diana would not be born for another eight years. I was a rebel. I always did the dance. I always did the opposite for real. I wasn't academically interested at all. I just wanted to be with people and have fun and, you know, look, look on after people, <laughs> things like that. I got the prize of being kind. This doesn't ring rebel. I know, so, but it was underlying. It was always there. Well, the rebel was going on underneath, but... But I didn't come out. Nineteen. Diana was eight. Prince Charles was nearly 21. And at Carnarvon Castle, he was about to be invested as Prince of Wales. I, Charles, Prince of Wales to become your liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship. It's a very demanding role, being Prince of Wales. But it's an equally more demanding role, being king. Who knows what fate will produce? Do you have any thoughts about the lady that a Prince of Wales should marry? Um, <laughs> yes. Well, I suppose, um, you see, it's awfully difficult because you've got to remember that when you marry, in my position, you're going to marry somebody who perhaps one day is going to become queen. And you've got to choose somebody very carefully, I think. And it's got to be somebody pretty special. Kensington Palace. James Colthurst, Etonian, doctor, minor aristocrat. He was a friend of Diana before the story began. She must have been just about 17. Yeah, she was pretty young. Well, she was great fun. Real breath of joy. Well, she had a flat in, uh, in uh, just on the old Brompton Road. It was Earl's Court, it was Earl Brompton Road. Loved it, so happy there. All girls of whom she was the declared chief chick. And I had three girls living with me. We had the best time of my life. And when fate came calling for Diana, James was there to witness it. Diana invited me around to dinner. And uh, as I arrived, she said, a uh, little bit sort of excitable, she said, I'm afraid I can't be here for dinner. I heard a good, strong engine of a car outside. The flatmates, uh, they mentioned in it was Prince Charles, and at that stage, I think the die was cast, as it were. Mm. Can it, is it any possibility that any announcements of your marriage in the near future can you tell me? Tell me if there's any possibility. I'm not going to say anything. Okay. Prince, Prince Charles sorry. did give us a hint himself. He said we wouldn't have to wait too long. <laughs> when things really started to get serious, when I was, uh, I was to be 18 and a half, I was asked to say some friends in Sussex, and they said, oh, Prince of Wales is staying at Axis Green Perna. So I thought, well, I haven't seen him for ages. He's just broken up with his girlfriend, that bat has just been killed. I said, it would be nice to see him. I was so unimpressed. Anyway, I sat there in his man book too, and I thought, well, I am quite impressed this time round. I was different and everything else. And he chatted me up, you know, like a bad rash. He was all over me. I thought, you know, hmm. Mm. And we were sitting on this bare straw of barbecue that night, and we were talking about Matt Batten and his girlfriend. And I said, you must be so lonely. I said, it's pathetic watching you walking up the aisle and support um, with my well, coughing in front. I said, you know, ghastly. He needs someone beside you. Oh, <laughs> wrong word. Whereupon he leapt upon me, started mm. kissing me and everything. I thought, yeah, yeah, you know, this is not what people do. And he was all over me for the rest of the evening, following me around, everything, like puppy. And um, yeah, I was flattered, but I was very puzzled. Next day, he said, he was coming to Buckingham Palace, and I've got some work to do, but you wouldn't mind sitting there while I do my work. And I thought, well, bugger it, I do mind sitting there while you do your work. And I said that, and uh, that sort of lit up something in him because someone answered back. 
That was quite a challenge. And then it started to gather. But he wasn't consistent with his courting abilities. He'd ring me out every day for a week and then he would speak to me for three weeks. Failed. And I, I accepted that. I thought, fine, well, he knows where I am, he wants me. And the thrill when he used to ring up was so immense and intense, drive the other three girls in my flat crazy. But, um, I, I think she, she had a dream, and uh, she hoped the dream would come to life. An older man uh, who was in a prominent position liked me, wanted to have me around. I think she had ideas of what she'd like it to be. And uh, I think there were other, other elements that it would have been difficult to foresee even had she been older. At the age of 19, although I was daunted at the prospect at the time, I felt I had the support of my husband to be. Balmoral Castle in the north of Scotland favorite retreat of the royal family. Now, Diana was invited as a guest. It's like being sucked in. You know, there's people pushing, mm. and people pulling, all in the same direction. But as Diana grew closer to the royal circle, she found that someone else was already there. Camilla Parker Bowles. Camilla went to the races. She was at the polo matches. Sometimes, even at Balmoral, Camilla was also a guest. This is where Charles courted Diana. And this is where Camilla sized her up. <laughs> yeah. Well, what a marvellous day for you today. Lovely day, it's a lovely day. And we're all very happy. I saw Diana last night. She's looking absolutely radiant. Radiant and very happy. I've never seen her look better. Just delighted and, and happy. And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> yes. so. Well, it obviously, means, own interpretation. obviously means two very happy people. Yes. Once yes. again, well, from us, congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. much. Very kind. And this ridiculous ITN man said, are you in love? So I thought, what a thick question. So I said, yes, of course we are, in the sort of fat, slow and range that I was. And Charles turned around and said, what in ever in love means? And that threw me completely. I thought, what a strange question. What strange answer. Oh, God. It traumatised me. At seven in the morning, Barbara Daly, makeup artist, arrived at Clarence House, where Diana was getting ready for the wedding. I liked her immediately. She was looking at the crowds on the small television that was just under the window, and she said, this is a lot of fuss for one girl getting married. We met 13 times when we got married. <laughs> Beautiful girl. The handsome prince, the sunshine, the crowds, a fairy tale. It was magical.
I desperately wanted to work. I desperately loved my husband. I wanted to share everything together. Charles Philip Arthur George, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her? I will. Diana, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband? I will. Here is the stuff of which fairy tales are made. For marriage has both a private face and a public importance. It must be specially true of this marriage in which are placed so many hopes. And stand for the truth that we help to shape this world and are not just its victims. honeymoon was over. Diana was no longer one of us on the outside looking in. Now she's on the inside looking out. It was isolating. You had to either sink or swim, and you had to learn that very fast. If I tripped up, which invariably I did, because I was new at the game, a ton of bricks came down on me. There were lots of tears. It was a few months after the wedding. Diana was 20 years old. In the autumn of 1981, she came here to the English National Ballet to take lessons from the dance instructor, Anne Allen, who was to become a confidant. That's it. There you go. Lovely. And release. When I first met her, you could see that there was huge shyness. But over time, as we went through our dance class, we realized just how much dance meant to her. She has danced in her soul. I realized the pure enjoyment that it gave her. She loved the freeness of being able to move and dance. She loved it. She loved it. I could see it helped to alleviate her emotional life. That was hard for her at that time. Maybe I was the first person ever to be in this family who ever had a depression or was ever openly tearful.
I was brought up in the sense that, you know, when you got engaged with someone, you loved them. She loved Charles, yes. But Charles loved another woman. It's very hard when, for any woman, when you love someone and you realize that perhaps they don't love you. Or I think it made her very sad, devastated. She felt she wasn't enough. BBC News at six o'clock. The Falkland Islands, the British colony in the South Atlantic, has fallen. That's what Argentina is saying. The large task force will sail as soon as all preparations are complete. I used to get in the car with Charles, and I used to blow in the car. There'd be crowds everywhere. And he said, no, what's the matter? I said, I can't get out of this car. He said, why? I said, I got this phone, but I can't get out of this car. I don't feel safe. You know? And I was neurotic almost. But then when I got out of the car, Buckingham Palace have just announced that the Princess of Wales is expecting a baby princess is said to be in excellent health. The Queen and members of both families are said to be delighted. The baby will be second in line to the throne. She told me that she was pregnant and she wanted to give her marriage absolutely everything that she could. We the British people are proud of what has been done. Proud of these heroic pages in our island story. Proud to be British. I felt the whole country was in labor with me. Everybody was thrilled to bits. It's been quite a difficult pregnancy. I hadn't been very well throughout it. So by the time William arrived, it was a great relief. But for Diana, the relief would be short-lived. When she realized that Charles is seeing Camilla, and you have to understand how hard that was to hear. We're talking 1981, two, three. I just remember being quite horrified about what she was telling me and at the same time rather shocked. She was worried about what it was that was going on. I know that she did ask Camilla to leave her husband alone. I thought that was quite brave of her actually because I know how much that must have taken for her to do that. And what do you do about it? What can you do about it? All you can do is to try to make the marriage work and hope in time that's, that things change. But that's not really what happened. I don't think the concerns about Camilla ever stopped. She was aware things had been going on. The staff all knew. Everybody knew. Everybody knew where he was going. So she didn't know who to trust. I noticed that she had lost a little bit of weight. And that's when she told me that she was bulimic. It was pure pressure, stress. You could see her fading physically. 
It was clear to all those who knew her that the bulimia was a reaction to her, the circumstances she found herself in. Everybody knew about the bulimia in the family, um, and they all blamed the failure of the marriage on the bulimia. And that's taken some time to get them to think differently. I said I was rejected, I didn't think I was good enough for this family, so I took it out on myself. I said I could have gone to alcohol, which would have been obvious. I could have been anorexic, which would be even more obvious. I decided to do a more discreet thing, which ultimately wasn't discreet, but um, I chose to hurt myself instead of hurting all of you. I felt compelled to perform. Compelled to go out and do my engagements and not let people down. And in a way, by being out in public, they supported me. Although they weren't aware just how much healing they were giving me. And it carried me through. We'd be going round, and all you could hear was, Oh, she's on the other side. Now, if you're a man, like my husband, proud man, you mind about that if you hear it every day for four weeks. I've come to the conclusion that really it would have been far easier to have had two wives. <laughs> to have covered both sides of the street. <laughs> and I could have walked down the middle directing the operation. We were a very good team in public, albeit what was going on in private. Our husband who loved someone else. There were two unhappy people in the marriage. In a letter, Charles told a friend, I'm in a kind of cage, pacing up and down and longing to be free. How awful incompatibility is. And how dreadfully destructive it can be for the players in this extraordinary drama. It has all the ingredients of a Greek tragedy. Friends on my husband's side were indicating that I was unstable, sick, and should be put in a home of some sort in order to get better. There's no better way to dismantle a personality and to isolate it. It was the mid-80s. There was division in the ranks of the royal family. And Diana was now increasingly willing to confront her husband over his relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles. In 1986, Ken Wharf joined Buckingham Palace to work as Princess Diana's Royal Protection Officer. Immediately she said, do you know about Camilla Parker Bowles? Well, I couldn't deny that I, I knew about it because I'd been informed about it. And I said, yes, of course. And um, there was a hesitation there. And she said, well, she features um, most days, most hours and minutes of my life. She sort of carried out her own research and found that previous Prince of Wales's had their own mistresses. I remember saying to my husband, you know, why, why this lady around? And he said, well, I refused to be the Prince of Wales and never had a mistress. This was the 20th century, moving into the 21st century, and she wasn't prepared to accept that. And she much prefer that Camilla Parker was would just disappear. There was a genuine unhappiness here. My father-in-law said to my 
husband, uh, if your marriage doesn't work out, you can always go back to her after five years, which is exactly it. I mean, for real, I knew that it happened after five years. I knew something was happening before that, but the fifth year, I had uh, confirmation. So I went to the top lady and I was sobbing and I said, what do I do? I'm coming to you, what do I do? And she said, I don't know what you should do. John was hopeless. And that was it. That was help. People were saying that she's mad. But the fact of it is that here was a case a woman trying to come to terms with the fact that her husband was in a relationship and having an affair with another woman. It is as simple as that. For the first time, doctors from all over Britain have met to discuss AIDS, the disease that's already claimed over 600 lives in the United States. Ignored by her husband, Diana focused her energy on her charity work. Then I found myself being more and more involved with people who were rejected by society. I found an affinity there. I respected very much the honesty I found on that level with people I met. What she really liked was to sit on the bed very informal. These were all people who were probably going to die. Patrick Jeffson was Diana's private secretary. Off and on, his ancestors had served the royal family for hundreds of years. Just knowing that she was needed, that what she was doing was worthwhile, gave her a great sense of fulfillment, I think. Because a lot of the time she felt excluded, real or imagined, from the royal mainstream and from the kind of happy family life that she had wanted for herself. When I used to sit on hospital beds and hold people's hands, when I saw the reassurance that gave I did it everywhere. So after a day of working in wards like this, we'd take her back to the palace, where I knew there was nobody waiting to welcome her or say, how did it go? Or, well done. So increasingly, this sort of work became more and more important to her. going to work for the prince and the princess in the late 1980s meant becoming part of an organization that had as its number one priority keeping quiet about the fact that this was a marriage in name only. There's virtually no sexual relation with you and the child. Sort of once every three weeks. And then it fizzled out about seven years ago, six years ago. In 1986, an unfulfilling marriage led Diana to begin a secret affair with Captain of the Guard, James Hewitt. Though she knew that she and Charles had a marriage in name only, Diana still hoped that the public face of their union could be saved. But Charles's relationship with Camilla was becoming ever more public. And in 1989, this led to a final confrontation. Camilla's sister's birthday. And I don't know where Diana just managed to conjure up this confidence. Calmly said to Camilla, and the Prince of Wales was completely shocked by this. And she said, look, I know what's going on. You know, I understand that. So don't, you know, sort of treat me like an idiot. And Camilla said something really unusual. And said, well, it's all right for you, Diana. You, you've got two wonderful boys. Now, <laughs> you can make of that what you like. I, I, I've never understood it. But suddenly, this was an awakening, because Diana knew at this point there was no hope or any chance of a reconciliation. So this had taken nearly eight, nine years to reach this point. But in her eyes, this was the beginning of the end. 
I'd cut my own cloth. And so Diana cut her own path. This was a new Diana, a people's princess in the making, modern, independent, even flirtatious. Not everyone was pleased. There was a great deal of jealousy from the grey men who sat behind Prince Charles, not wanting him to be living in her shadow. Her character was being written down, as she saw it, as a campaign to sideline her and remove her from the boys. That was her worry, was that she was going to lose the boys, overriding above everything else. That was the concern. November. Windsor Castle was engulfed in flames, burning for 15 hours and damaging 100 rooms. Like so much of the monarchy, the home of the Windsor dynasty, its most potent symbol, seemed to be collapsing before our eyes. In 1992 was the 40th anniversary of the Queen's accession to the throne. It had not been a happy year. And in a speech she gave to the Guildhall in the City of London, there was a note in her voice that we'd never heard before. In 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. <clears throat> it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. I, like Queen Victoria, have always been a believer in that old maxim, moderation in all things. Her body language suggesting a marriage in deep trouble. She does one thing on her own, he does another and they just don't meet physically, mentally, or emotionally. How much longer can this tragedy go on, howled the Daily Mirror this morning. December 1992. Two weeks after the Queen's speech, it was officially announced that Diana and Prince Charles had decided to separate. La France va-t-elle redonner le sourire à Lady Diana? Diana, la princesse trahie par l'institution monarchique outre-Manche, déterminée à donner un sens à son existence de princesse. I remember at the time there was a mixture of relief because we no longer had to pretend. And we no longer had to maintain that fiction. But at the same time, we were always conscious that there was a big, silent, rather threatening presence that told us, certainly told me, that the princess wasn't really wanted anymore. People's agendas changed overnight. I was a problem. I was a liability. It became a condition of your patriotism that you must therefore support the Prince of Wales. Well, I'm sorry. As a loyal monarchist, my loyalty was to the principles of, of the British crown. And I saw royal virtues embodied in her more than in him. But I think the real damage was done by those who tried to marginalize her. They saw that their man's path 
to the crown would be a great deal easier if he were not competing for popularity with his ex-wife. But as Diana's fame grew, so did the fear of her popular appeal. It's the strength that causes the fear. Why is she strong? Where did she get it from? Where is she taking it? Where is she going to use it? Nineteen ninety three. There was a Charles camp. There was a Diana camp. Diana watched as the vast and ancient power of the court lined up behind the future king. She knew her public appeal was her strongest weapon, so she began taking lessons in public speaking with a speech coach. Yes, that's, that's where I come from. So. Oh. If you come in here, you sit down and be quiet. You've got to be very quiet. Very quiet. Don't touch it, William, because it's all focused on me. <clears throat> okay, let's do it. Let's pretend, right? Okay, so your Royal Highness, um, you're currently concentrating very much on your charity work. Would you like to tell us why you feel it's so important to you? I got nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, this records a lot. <laughs> go back, go back, go back to the top now. This is what we're doing. Number one, she had been abandoned by her family, having become a huge embarrassment and disgrace. Each person is born with individual qualities and potential. Slightly faster now. Let's move on, yes. Only slightly. <laughs> Get a little angry now with that. I can't be angry and speak like yes, that. Yes, you can. I can't get my words out. I'm so tired. When am I going to see you when you're not tired? In the mornings, ladies and gentlemen. More energy. <laughs> not bad, eh? Not bad. <laughs> the British people need someone in public life to give affection. I just remember walking in, in a striking orange outfit. Gemma Quinn was only 11 when she met Diana for a short private conversation. I know that that day changed my life. She was the most genuine person I've ever met. Even now, I still can look back on that meeting and it helps me get through. I don't think there's another human being who could have such an impact in such a short space of time. She understood personal struggle and I think she could relate to people going through their own personal battles. Diana's own personal battles continued. Now, I just come here. It's like that. That lens is who you're talking to. Her speech coach wanted her to discover her own voice. This is not. This is not to be wasted. But she had to find it herself. Ladies and gentlemen. Stop. There's a lovely chunk in there. You were pushing the thing out and it started to come from you. That's, that's what connects you mm. and see who we're, who we're after. Because I'm not manufacturing you, I'm just <laughs> bringing out <laughs> that bit of you that wants a voice, which is the 30-year-old woman, 31-year-old woman, who has something important to say. You've got a voice that people want to hear. And the quality you have, which they haven't got, is that you talk to them from the guts. You know, person of the people. They're scared of that. So let's not lose it. Let's keep it the way. The establishment that I'm married into 
They see me as a, a threat of some kind, because I lead from the heart, not the head. For Charles, the threat of Diana was real. People were beginning to ask whether he'd become king after all. In 1994, in an effort at damage control, Charles decided to come clean about his marriage in an interview with Jonathan Dimbleby. Were you faithful and honourable to your wife when you took on the vow of marriage? Yes, absolutely. And you were? Yes. Until it became irretrievably broken down us both having tried. Charles was asked if he had any regrets. Obviously, I would much rather it didn't, it hadn't happened. And uh, I'm sure um, my wife would have felt the same. Um, it wasn't through lack of trying, you know, both parts trying. But Diana saw Charles's collaboration with Jonathan Dimbleby as part of a campaign to turn the tables on her. She was faced with a choice of either meekly turning a deaf ear to what was being said about her, to falling in with the plans of people who wanted to see her excluded, marginalized, or doing something about it. 1995, in Kensington Palace, Diana was secretly sitting for her famous interview with BBC's Panorama. Asked if she was prepared to step down quietly from her public role, Diana's answer was defiant. I'll fight till the end, because I believe that I have a role to fulfil. And I got two children to bring up. Diana's performance in Panorama surprised everyone. No one had ever heard her talking like this before. It was a new voice. She chose to fight back. The people who criticized her always underestimated her. And not least, they underestimated her anger. She was a proud aristocratic woman who had been very badly treated. Do you think you'll ever be queen? <sighs> no, I don't, no. Why do you think that? I'd like to be a queen of people's hearts, in people's hearts, but I don't see myself being queen of this country. And then Diana was asked, do you think the Prince of Wales will ever be king? It's a question that's in everybody's head. I don't think any of us know the answer to that. But who knows? Within a year, Diana and the Prince of Wales divorced. She would not become Queen of England. But Diana remained in the public eye through her high-profile work supporting those affected by leprosy, AIDS and landmines. By 1997, she was arguably the most famous woman in the world. On June the 3rd, she arrived at the Albert Hall for the English National Ballet's performance of Swan Lake. She always told people who asked her that if she hadn't been a princess, she'd have liked to have been a dancer. Now, she had come to the ballet for the last time.
This is BBC Radio in London. The French government minister has said within the past few minutes that Diana, Princess of Wales, has died. I remember coming on breaking news and it, it was just too much to even absorb. The idea of what had happened. I couldn't stop thinking that if only I had still been protecting her, something like this would never have happened. Her last few months didn't give me the impression that she knew where she was going or how she was going to get there or who she was going to go with. The crash came through on the news in Paris and strange enough I expected her to call. Of course when she had a crisis that's when she'd sometimes call. Of course, she, she wasn't going to call. Over a million people lined the route of Diana's cortege. An outpouring of popular grief led the Queen to agree to a royal ceremonial funeral. Diana's coffin was followed by her two sons, former husband and father-in-law. The service took place in Westminster Abbey, attended by over 2,000 guests, including the Queen. It just felt like such an honour to be invited to the funeral. To lose a person like that, it just makes it even more precious, the time we had. Diana sadly dies in a tragic road accident in Paris. And then what happens? The Prince of Wales did marry Camilla Parker Bowles. A lot of the things that I admired about the monarchy, for me, died with the Princess of Wales. And more than that, with the way in which she was treated before she died. That idea of the monarchy has died for me. People's emotions, people's hopes and dreams, The fairy story had come to an end. <laughs>